Let's turn to the book of Jude for the last time in this series on the penultimate book of the Bible. We read the whole epistle, beginning therefore with Jude 1. Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to them that are sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ and called. Mercy unto you and peace and love be multiplied. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that ye should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and thereby denying the only Lord God, even our Lord Jesus Christ. I will therefore put you in remembrance, though ye once knew this, how that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed them that believed not. And the angels, which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Likewise also these filthy dreamers defile the flesh, despise dominion, and speak evil of dignities. Yet Michael the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses, durst not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke thee. But these speak evil of those things which they know not, but what they know naturally as brute beasts in those things they corrupt themselves. Woe unto them, for they have gone in the way of Cain and ran greedily after the heir of Balaam for reward and perished in the gainsaying of Korah. These are spots in your feasts of charity when they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear. Clouds they are without water carried about of winds. Trees whose fruit withereth without fruit, twice dead, plucked up by the roots, raging waves of the sea, foaming out their own shame, wandering stars, to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment upon all and to convict all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed and of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. These are murmurers, complainers, walking after their own lusts, and their mouth speaketh great swelling words, having men's persons in admiration because of advantage. But beloved, remember ye the words which were spoken before of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, how that they told you there should be mockers in the last time who should walk after their own ungodly lusts. But these be they who separate themselves, or cause divisions, sensual, having not the Spirit. 
But ye, beloved, building up yourselves in your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. And if some have compassion, making a difference or a distinction, and others <coughs> say it with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to preserve you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, to the only wise God our Saviour, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and ever. Amen. Let us now reread Jude 24 and 25. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, to the only wise God our Saviour be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and ever. Amen. Here we have, beloved, the last words in the epistle of Jude. The last extant sentence of the half-brother of our Lord Jesus Christ, his last canonical statement, which then constitute the last text in this sermon series on Jude, entitled, Earnestly Contending for the Faith. Summarize our last few sermons briefly, beloved. In the last six verses of Jude, we have, first of all, the believer's calling regarding himself in verses 20 and 21. Namely, keep yourself in the love of God, in knowing it and experiencing it and in exercising it. And you do this, Jude teaches us, by doing three things by his grace. Building yourself up in your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost, and looking for the mercy to be brought to us with the second coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Then Jude tells us, not merely our calling regarding ourselves, but our calling regarding those who err. Witness to them, admonish them, seek to reclaim them, either by a way chiefly of mercy, because of various considerations, the weakness or the newness to the faith of such a one, or the way of fear. Teach them the wickedness of what they ought to, and what awaits them if they do not repent. But the subject of our text this morning is not the calling of the believer with regard to himself or with regard to erring brethren. God is the subject of our text, the one to whom we are to bring or ascribe glory. And that's our theme this morning, Jude's concluding doxology. Jude's concluding doxology. First, its distinctive nature, a nature simply refers to what something is, then its fitting address and its beautiful ascription. <clears throat> Jude's concluding doxology, its distinctive nature, its fitting address and its beautiful ascription. What exactly is our text? What is its form? Jude 24 and 25 is not a benediction, though it has been used as such. Our text does not call for a divine blessing upon God's people. It's not a benediction. Our text is not either a prayer 
doesn't ask God for anything as such. That is, it makes no petitions. The last two verses in Jude are not either a thanksgiving. (coughs) They do not express gratitude to the Most High. The passage does not begin, for example, I thank God or we thank God. The nature of our text is that of a doxology. Because a doxology ascribes glory to God. Listen to the text again from this perspective. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to the only wise God our Savior be glory. An ascription of glory to God. Be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and ever. Amen. That's a doxology. So the theme of this morning's sermon is Jude's concluding doxology. And the word concluding is not designed to suggest that Jude has another doxology earlier in his epistle concluding simply means here that Jude's letter concludes or ends with this doxology having identified the nature of the text as a doxology We need to ask, what's distinctive about this doxology? Let's nail this down and see what God is teaching us here. In the process of doing this, I'm going to refer to other doxologies found in the New Testament. Does this text ascribe glory to God because of his virtues or perfections? That's the idea of the doxology in 1 Timothy 1 verse 17. Now unto the King, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. (coughs) Amen. That's not the idea of this doxology. What about glorifying God for his creation? That's the idea in Revelation 4 verse 11. Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. Creation isn't spoken of in our text. What about a doxology for all of God's wonders? That's Romans 11 verse 36. For of him and through him and to him are all things. To whom be glory forever. Amen. And you grasp the idea of that text. Of him are all things, because he is the source of all things, according to his decree and creative power. And through him are all things, because they exist and are governed by the divine operation. And to him are all things, because he is the goal of the entire universe and everything that happens in it. But our text isn't so all-encompassing as Romans 11, 36. Let me quote you a doxology from Revelation 7 to God for his salvation. Salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne, and unto the Lamb. Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might 
be unto our God forever and ever. Amen. Well, salvation is too broad for our text. The doxology of Jude 24 and 25 is more specific. It deals with salvation, all right, but an element or two within that broader concept. And that, of course, prompts the question, well, what exactly? What aspect or aspects of salvation are in view in our text? Let's consider it in terms of the four positive points of Calvinism. Because total depravity is a point of Calvinism, but it's not a positive thing. We don't thank God because we're totally depraved. <coughs> we thank God for the four positive works summarized under the rubric of Calvinism that deliver us from our total depravity. Unconditional election. That's the subject of the doxology or blessing of God in Ephesians 1. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ according as he hath chosen or elected us in him before the foundation of the world. You shouldn't hate God for unconditional election. You should bless God for it. That's what the people of God do from the heart. But election isn't mentioned in our text, though it's everywhere presupposed in the Bible. Unconditional election before the foundation of the world, and therefore a limited or a particular atonement that Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, laid down his life for the sheep and the lambs only. That's the subject of the doxology in Revelation 5, where we read that they sang a new song. Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain, and hast redeemed us to God, redeemed us to God, by thy blood, out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation, a death for the whole Catholic or universal church, and thou hast made us unto our God, by thy atonement, kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. But that's not our text either, though we're getting warmer. Scripture even includes a doxology for what we call irresistible grace in Ephesians 3. That chapter ends with these words, Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, According to his power that worketh in us, that's irresistible grace, that works in us unto him. Be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. But that's not this word of God in Jude either. It's dealing instead with the perseverance of the saints or more precisely with God's preserving us so that we persevere as saints. Listen with this in mind to verse 24. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling. And then there's something else. It goes on to say and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. Two things. A doxology to God because of his preservation of the saints. He's able to keep us from falling. And for our glorification. 
preservation while on earth, and glorification in the world to come. To present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. This is what I mean by the distinctive nature of our text. It's a doxology. According glory to God. It's not a prayer. It's not a benediction. It's not a thanksgiving. It's a doxology. And it's a doxology to God for his preservation and glorification of all of his elect people. That's how Jude, by the Holy Spirit, chooses to conclude his canonical epistle. So this doxology is fittingly addressed, first of all, here we're going deeper, unto him that is able to keep you from falling. And regarding the word able, the Arminian interjects at this point, oh yes, God is able to keep you from falling, but, listen out for the but, but if you're not willing, but if you go astray from God, you're genuinely saved, and God was able to keep you if only you had done your part, but you didn't. And so, after all, salvation depends upon the free will of the sinner. Able. And in English, able could mean that. In English, not Greek, and in this verse, and without anything else that the Bible teaches, and without anything else what it says about who God is and what salvation is, we would grant that able could mean that. Someone could say, I'm, I'm able to run five miles. But in all probability, next week I won't do any running at all. But I'm able, I think I am, someone might say. I have the potential to do it, I just don't. But let me explain the word able. First of all, the word able is that from which we get the word dynamite. That's not a conclusive argument all by itself, but it suggests we're dealing here with vast, infinite power. And let me give you some other instances of the use of this word able. First of all, Philippians 3 verse 21 teaches that God will change our humble, weakened bodies, that it may be fashioned like unto Christ's glorious resurrection body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. The text is not saying that God is able to make everything subservient to his will, but he doesn't really. The text is saying that God is able to subdue everything unto himself, and this is what he does, and therefore it's child's play for God to raise the dead body of the saint, even if it has been atomized by a nuclear bomb. Another text, 2 Timothy 1 verse 12. Here Paul says, and he's near his martyrdom, I know whom I have believed absolutely certain and I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day the last day of judgment and when Paul is saying thinking I'm very soon going to die for the name of Jesus that God is able to keep me and my soul and my salvation he doesn't mean that God can do it if I let him he means that God will powerfully keep me right until my last breath and make me shine like the angels in heaven on the final day of judgment. The God who is able to keep you from falling means the God who has the power to do it and the God who will most certainly do it. And then... Nailing down another word, the God who is able to keep you from falling. What is the falling spoken of here? It does not refer to God's keeping us from falling into sin. God did not keep Adam from falling into sin. He did not keep the whole human race from falling into sin. 
in Adam, and he has not kept a single son or daughter of Adam, Christ accepted, from falling into sin. That's not the idea of falling here. It doesn't mean that God will keep every saint from backsliding or some particularly grievous fall. Various saints have done such things. The Bible mentions many too. The falling that is spoken of in our text is a total and a final falling. It refers to an utter apostasy from God and Jesus Christ. It refers ultimately even to a falling into the lake of fire forever under Jehovah's just judgment. Spurgeon once referred to different senses of the word falling like this. You're on a ship and God promises to the believer that though you may fall on the deck by sinning, you will not fall overboard, as it were, into perdition. It's the final fatal falling of apostasy that our text is dealing with. And this fits perfectly with the clear and overwhelming testimony of Scripture as regarding God's preservation of his saints. In John 10, Jesus says, All my sheep are in my hand, and no one is able to pluck one of them out. And then, in case anyone has an Arminian notion in their head, he added immediately, They're all also in the hand of my Father, and no one is able to pluck them out of his hand. And the idea is that we're in Christ's hand, and God's hands over that again. In John 17, in Christ's high priestly prayer, on the basis of the sacrifice for sin he was about to offer for his own, not the world, but those whom God gave to him, Jesus prayed, Father, keep them. And every one of Jesus' prayers is answered. 1 Peter 1 verse 5 says that we are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. And this statement is found in the epistle of Jude. In the light of all the things that he has said up to this point to enforce this truth upon the saints that God keeps all of his true elect people so that none of them are destroyed like the unbelieving Israelites in the wilderness or like the angels that fail or like the homosexuals in Sodom and Gomorrah God is able to keep you from falling Jehovah preserves all his blood-bought church so that they do not perish in the way of Cain or with the greed of Balaam or in the rebellion of Korah. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling is so fitted to this epistle because it assures us that God will keep all true believers from the false teachers, from believing the false gospel, and from the antinomian corruption of the truth, which says it really doesn't matter if you're in, this, in the church and you sin and don't repent and live like the world. God will let you into heaven anyway, which is the teaching of many in the Presbyterian church in Ireland as evidence for that horrible letter that they sent in. You can be a homosexual. You can live and die in that sin. And we think you ought to be able to be called a true member of Jesus Christ and have your children baptized. Sheer wickedness, the sort of thing that Jude was written to deal with. And so it is that Jude finishes this epistle as it began. 
In verse 1, he addresses his letter to them that are sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ and called. So he begins his doxology. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling, because you are the preserved, the kept. The second part, beloved, of this fitting address is unto him that is able to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. And this adds a lot. That not only will all the elect be kept in this life, but also every last one of them will be glorified in the next life. God here promises that we will be faultless. That is, without any blot or spot or blemish or even a little speckle of sin. So ethically or morally, we will be completely sinless and pure. That's what it's saying. Moreover, God promises that we will be spiritually unblemished and spotless before the presence of God's glory, not merely before the eyes of man. And you can come to church and you put your suit on and you're in your best behavior, and even our children are in their best behavior too, and somebody can say, my, what an upstanding Christian, what a godly fellow. I don't even know any sins or weaknesses in him. Probably don't know him that well. But this text refers to our being without blemish before the presence of God's glory. That's something else. The all-knowing and thrice holy God himself will not be able to see any moral stains on us whatsoever. So that we who believe will be able not merely to stand up in church and sing a psalm, but we will be able to stand in the resplendent glory of the triune God on the final judgment day and not be destroyed and not even fall over backwards or stumble. We will be completely innocent and righteous. That's what the text is saying. And furthermore, this doxology refers to a grand and official presentation of us as morally pure and without any stain of sin whatsoever. In an official ceremony, so to speak, that is the last day, Almighty God will present us, each individual believer included, with great peace and contentment and rejoicing in his heart. Here they are. Look what I've done for them. And he will present us to himself in Jesus Christ without any stain whatsoever even upon the lowliest member of the church. And this public presentation of God's ethically spotless church to himself will be an occasion of great joy. And this isn't referring to God's rejoicing over his people with singing, as Zephaniah 3 puts it, but the focus here is on our joy. God will present you. Believe this, child of God. Even though you're weak and sinful, God will present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy in your heart. You will have on that day more joy than you have ever had in all your life put together. You will have on that day a greater joy than you ever thought possible. Because let's face it, we live our lives at a fairly 
flat sort of level. We're not that excited about that much. Our spiritual life is very weak. We have a small beginning of the new obedience. And therefore, though Christ's joy is in us, we just have a first fruits of it. Well, here, standing spotless in the presence of God's glory, we will have exceeding joy. And this is an entirely appropriate address and doxology in Jude's day and ours. Think of it. We're surrounded by a filthy world, and the world is a million times more filthy than we in our lowest thoughts ever realize that it is because it tries to keep its filth hidden beneath the veneer of respectability. The Church of Christ is beset by apostatizing churches, by heretical teachers, and by false Christians. So at any one time on the earth, the true elect church is only a remnant. And then all the members of the church are abased by their own inner depravity and misery. And Jude concludes his little but powerful epistle with this doxology, Now unto him that's able to keep you from falling, and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. And then comes the third and final part of the address of his concluding doxology. To the only wise God, our Savior. And this third address is not on a par with the previous two addresses. It's not this, a doxology to the God who keeps us from falling. And as a second ground, a doxology to the God who presents us faultless on the last day. And then, as a third ground, to the only wise God, our Saviour. Instead, this third address carries this idea. Glory to the only wise God, who in his unique wisdom is the only one who can and does keep us from falling and preserve us faultless on the great judgment day. Jude is telling us here to meditate upon the infinite wisdom of God in preserving all the millions and millions of saints from apostasy and destruction through all the ages. There was Lot, the man who foolishly separated himself from Father Abraham because the love of money had too big a sway over that believer's heart. And then it got him into Sodom. And the all-wise God decided to himself, how am I going to take Lot out? I'll send one of my angels from heaven in human form to grab him by the hand and drag him out. And then you have Samson, whose besetting sin was fornication. And in the wisdom of God, God willed that Samson lose his eyes but keep his soul. And then David committed adultery. He broke his vows, and Bathsheba did too, and murdered her husband to try to hush it all up. And God, in his wisdom, sent Nathan with a special parable about a rich man, the poor man, the little lamb, and then worked his irresistible grace so that after many months of hardening his heart in that sin, and refusing to acknowledge and repent of it, he broke down and sought God's mercy. And then there was Jehoshaphat, a godly man, true, but who fell repeatedly into a false ecumenism, an incredibly naive believer who thought that the rulers of the northern kingdom were probably a little bit off, but that they were basically... Their heart was basically in the right place. And so God had to rebuke him time after time for his sin by the prophets. God had to destroy his navy in the harbor to try and sober him up and bring him back. And eventually God had him witness a pagan king's sacrificing his own son. And the only wise God brought Jehoshaphat back, 
restoring him to his spiritual sense. And then there was Peter, who denied Christ three times with oaths and cursings. And the unique wisdom of God brought him to repentance by a crowing rooster through many bitter tears and the loving words of the Savior by the shores of the Sea of Galilee. We'll touch on that, Lord willing, this evening. The Lord knoweth in his wisdom, the Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptations and their lamentable fall in his infinite wisdom. He brings chastisement. You won't listen to the word of God? Okay, I love you so much that I'm going to beat you until you get to grips with your sin. And I'm going to bring you to repentance. And God does that with every true elect child of God. And sometimes the believer almost only knows he's a believer because scripture says, whom God loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he delights in. And I've seen that too. I've seen people who've erred grievously and you think, is that person really saved or not? And you think, my only hope for that person's salvation is all the misery that God seems to put them through. The wretched things that happen in their lives. That makes me think that maybe that person is a Christian because God keeps hitting them hard. And it amazes me why they don't yet return. They keep on in their foolish way. But God in his wisdom knows how to deliver the godly. And it's only because he is unspeakably wise that God our Savior can present the whole church faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. And included in this faultlessness and being without spot is our justification. How can God, being just and righteous, forgive sins? How can God declare that we are perfectly righteous when of ourselves we're not? Well, the wisdom of God issued in the holy, sinless life of Jesus who earned for us the righteousness of God. The wisdom of God resulted in Christ's sacrificial and atoning death bearing the punishment due to all of God's chosen ones. The wisdom of God led to the incarnation, led to Christ's substitution for us. His penal <coughs> sufferings, his covenant headship as the representative of all those the Father gave to him. The wisdom of God raised him from the dead and gave faith to all of God's children and included in the faultlessness of all true saints on the last day is not only our justification but our sanctification god knows in his wisdom how to take foolish sinful people like us and make us completely pure and holy he regenerates us grants us a new nature there's a progressive sanctification whereby we die unto sin and live unto holiness. And then at our death or on the second coming of Jesus Christ, God completely purifies us on the basis of our Savior's death and through the irresistible grace of the Holy Spirit. Only the wisdom of the true and living God could have done that. So finally we come to the beautiful ascription at the end of our text. Because four things are ascribed to God. And the first is <coughs> glory. Now on to him, the one who keeps us from falling, the one who presents us faultless, and thereby shows in those two things that he's the only wise God our Savior. Now on to him be glory. And from that word glory, in its Greek form, that we get our English word doxology. And it kept cropping up in the doxologies I quoted earlier. This refers to the divine luminescence or effulgence or brilliance, which is the light to which no man can approach. 
Nobody here has ever looked directly at the sun. Don't try it. You could be as blind as Samson. But the divine effulgence wouldn't just strike you blind, it would kill you. Well, there's that glory of God, which the Old Testament describes as a massive weight that impresses you <coughs> such that you just fall to your knees if you see a little of it. Glory to God and majesty, his regal awesomeness, the grace of the kingdom of God that preserves and glorifies. And the word dominion speaks of God's might and strength which are needed to justify, sanctify, preserve, and glorify all the members of Christ's body. And the fourth thing ascribed to God is power, which literally means right or legal authority. <coughs> that is, the legal authority to save the church belongs to God alone. The power to do it resides in his essence. The divine king acts in his majesty to save his realm and thereby shows his glory. All these things belong to God essentially and are therefore by the church rightly accorded to him as his alone. What we're dealing with here is one of the five solas or, rep, or onlys proclaimed especially at the Reformation. Soli Deo Gloria. Glory to God alone. That's how Jude finishes his short epistle. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit through the mediator, our Lord Jesus Christ. And when the child of God hears this, even if he's really sleepy and dead in his heart, and hasn't had a good week, spiritually speaking, he says to himself in his heart, that's what I want to do. Bring glory to God. That's what my life's all about. And that's what Jude is saying we must think about. And then Jude adds, that there are two time periods in which these four things, glory, majesty, dominion, and power, must be ascribed to God. And first of all, there's now, now in this life, now in this pew, right in the present, and in the future, the now age of this present world. Glory, honor, dominion, Power when I'm dead, when my children are living and I'm long gone, and when my grandchildren are flourishing, and when this congregation keeps going, when nobody even here knows my name, and I'm just on some of the membership rolls in a big book, and all around the world. Glory, majesty, dominion, and power, both now at this moment and throughout the whole of the remaining New Testament age and all around the globe. And then, into the world to come, both now and ever. Because this is the only entirely fitting and proper way. There must always be glory brought to God. And the believer doesn't want there to be a single moment when the triune God is not praised. This is the reason why he saved me. This is the reason why I live. And if I cannot worship and serve God, I don't want to live. And a world without the worship of God on it ought to be destroyed immediately as completely useless. Which is why God always preserves people on the planet who worship him. Because if there was a moment when there wasn't one elect believer on the globe, God would smash it immediately. This teaches us too the right attitude of those who earnestly contend for the faith. The theme of the epistle, the right attitude is not, well, I'm a sort of a street fighter. 
And I like getting into a good row. And there's nothing that gets my blood pumped as to clobber some Arminian or heretic in some other field. That's not the right attitude. No, I fight for the faith. I earnestly contend for the faith. And I do it by the grace of God. And in the way in which he describes, says the Christian. But I also do it as a worshipper. I earnestly contend for the faith, as it says in verse 3 all the way up to verse 19. And I do it as one who brings honour to God. The only wise God, our Saviour, may glory and majesty and dominion and power be ascribed always to him. That's my attitude, says the believer. And so Jude concludes with these four ascriptions of worship to God, glory, majesty, dominion and power over two periods which encompass all that's left of time with one cordial assent. The only way you could finish it. Amen. And when Jude says Amen, he means it will be so. I have absolute confidence that this is what God's going to do. And he means I earnestly desire this to be so. Amen. It will happen and I really want it to happen. And all the people of God say this. The old people, not merely, but the young people too. To God alone be the glory. Glory, majesty, dominion and power be rendered to him both now and ever. Amen. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank thee for the riches of thy word. And we pray that thou would bless it to us, that thou would stir up our hearts, that we may render to thee the praise and accord to thee the majesty and glory and dominion and right that belong to thee as the one true God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.